This is Radio Eco Shock with Alex Smith. We are witnessing the end of the age of ice on Earth. I'm pretty sure about it. It sounds great, doesn't it? Especially during blustery February. We'll cancel the celebrations. Sea level rise is going to be wicked this century, and for centuries after that, we will redraw the maps if we have maps. We will withdraw from ports. We will lose the weather we need for agriculture and maybe regroup into little tribes that will survive somewhere. It's news that good. And new revelations from climate science are coming in so fast, no single scientist or radio host can hope to keep track of it all. It is like standing in front of a fire hose. In this program, we're going to surf some of the highlights with our favorite climate generalist, Paul Beckwith. Paul has a master's degree and an engineering degree. He taught climate science at two Canadian universities. Now he is, without a doubt, the world's biggest climate teacher on YouTube, with over 500 videos full of charts, satellite images, and plain explanations about the bizarre unfolding of climate change. We're going to cover the whole wild world, from the South Pole through Australia to Europe, North America, all the way to the North Pole. From Ottawa, Canada, Paul Beckwith, welcome back to Radio EcoShock. Hello, Alex. It's a pleasure to be on the program. People like to talk about the weather, Paul. How has the weather been in eastern Canada lately? Well, I call it uh, weather whiplashing or weather wilding or weather weirding, whichever <laughs> whichever uh, term you prefer. You know, we go from uh, very, very cold weather, almost uh, record low temperatures. You know, we're there for, you know, a week or so, and then we swing up to above above freezing temperatures for a few days, and then we switch back down to very, very cold temperatures, and this cycle seems to repeat all of the time. Of course, it's very, very hard on infrastructure because those uh, thawing cycles, you know, melt the uh, snow and ice, which then goes into the cracks and, and roads, et cetera, these uh, transitions to warm and to cold are extremely fast. They often happen with temperatures changing even a couple degrees per hour, you know, whether it's going up or down. And this is very, very hard on infrastructure. Yeah, I saw a weather forecaster on TV in the States talking about a 70-degree Fahrenheit switch, 21 degrees C within 24 hours. And yes, it is hard on infrastructure, but it's really toxic to plants. I worry we will see tree die off and lost perennials from those sub-zero chills followed by spring-like warmth the next day. I guess we'll find out. Yes, it's very, very hard on the plants. It's very hard on, on animals as well. They're confused about what's happening. You know, some of them might think spring's on the way and... and, and like, like a lot of them aren't surviving, especially with some of the temperatures in the southern hemisphere. There's lots of animals that just aren't surviving these temperature swings and these extreme temperatures. So, you know, we're, we, we're comfortable in our houses, hopefully, uh, although I did read that, that a huge number of homeless people uh, perished in these latest chilling temperatures in, in, in the U.S., although the numbers aren't, aren't, aren't all in on that. But, I mean, they didn't have a place to go. They very likely did not survive. We hardly ever hear about that. Every time I see the forecasts about the super cold, then they talk about the trouble it's going to be for airlines and commuters, and you wouldn't know that there's more than half a million homeless people on the streets in America, and they're getting hit pretty hard. I, I wait for the person to talk about it, and they never do. Well, look, when we think about global warming, we do imagine the hot days, way too hot days and fires, which we've been through. And we are going to get to that later on in the show, but I think right now it's time to talk about what I call the winter of climate change. And do we have some clues, Paul, about what the new winter is going to be like? We've talked numerous times about the uh, jet stream and how the jet stream is changing, how it's slowing down and becoming wavier. So this outbreak of cold air, you know, which has been coined the... Um, dividing or splitting or collapsing of the polar vortex, which brought a huge mass of very cold, dry air over the U.S., deep to the south. I mean, with the jet stream waviness and, and pieces actually breaking off of these waves, that, which are extending very far south and as far north as the North Pole, this is just the world that we're living in right now. I mean, the Arctic is still darkening at very fast rates. 
We're rapidly losing sea ice and snow cover. So the temperature is all wonky up there, if you like. It's, it's much warmer than it should be. So the temperature gradient to the equator is lower. So we're getting these jet streams and um, becoming so distorted and wavy. They're, you, you know, it's hard to call them even a jet stream anymore. It's just a fractured mishmash of high-velocity uh, air up in, at the border between the stratosphere and the, and the troposphere. So one of the things we'll talk about maybe in a bit, is James Hansen's most recent paper called Global Temperature in 2018 and Beyond. I'll do a, a bit, at least a video or two on this in the next few days. But basically, they're showing that this, this really cold temperature over North America is just, it's just over North America. I mean, if you look at some of the maps, they, they show this cold area you know, over North America and the rest of the planet is much warmer than normal. So, yeah, winters are definitely heading out, but there's lots of these surprises as we transition through abrupt climate change from what the, the stable world that we had before to, to where we're heading. And if there is global warming, people from California mountains to upper New York State to Britain and Moscow are all asking after their big dumps, why are we digging out from so much darn snow? Yes, and uh, we do know that, you know, in a world that's generally warming, there's, there's more water vapor in the atmosphere. So when we have seasonal changes, the oceans have warmed so much that, you know, as the season changes and we move through um, fall into winter, the land cools down and, you know, we have the very warm oceans that are producing huge amounts of moisture that's going over the land, causing massive snow dumps. So there's, there's lots of regional effects that are coming into play, but it's very important to remember the big picture of the greatly warming Arctic has just messed up the circulation patterns in the atmosphere and ocean, and we're really suffering the consequences of this right now. Yeah, in uh, Germany, Eastern Europe, and there was a snowfall in Moscow that they hadn't seen, the like of which, for 70 years. And scientists are now saying, well, look, the Baltic Sea is abnormally warm, and that's lofting more moisture into the air. And that's going to be like a, an extreme precipitation event, but if it's winter, that comes down as snow. So global warming can create more snow, and that drives some trolls crazy. Yes, it does, absolutely. And if you think about the jet streams, getting back to them again, I mean, they, do they dominate the, the climate system and they dominate the weather patterns. But when they're so weak and broken up, and distorted, then one has to ask, what is the new effects that dominate, you know, weather patterns? And basically what it is, is, is the land-sea contrast. And I've done a number of videos on this. You know, if you Google Arctic monsoon, basically what the monsoon effect is, is, you know, in the summer, like the land always heats up or cools down faster than the ocean because water has retains heat and releases it slower. So it has a much higher heat capacity than soil or air or anything else. So the land, in the summer, the land will heat up much faster than the ocean. So because the land is hotter, the hot air over the land will rise up, creating a low-pressure area, like a partial vacuum, if you like, and that sucks air from surrounding water bodies, and that, that air is laden with moisture. Okay, so then that moisture comes across and it rises up and we get all of these storms. So in the winter, of course, the land is cooling down much faster than the oceans. Okay, so the, the breezes that come off the ocean will then give dumps of snow. So these effects are being seen around the planet, actually. They're much more regional effects. So we're, we're going into this monsoon-type world and, and a monsoon just dumps huge amounts of water on the land so if it's in the summer it's going to be rainfall and you know we're talking about inches of rain per hour and causing to, leading to massive floods torrential rains and then in the winters the uh, precipitation of course is you know because of weather whiplashing it could be dumps of snow it could be dumps of freezing rain it could be and both i mean we had actually in southern ontario we had some thunderstorms looking to develop a few days ago when the temperatures were, you know, reached well above zero. In fact, Toronto a few days ago was plus 12 degrees Celsius, if you can believe that. It set a, it set a high temperature record a few days ago, whereas a few days previous to that, it was setting low temperature records of wind chills, of, you know, minus 35, minus 40 almost wind chills. Like, and it goes from one to the other and then back. And this is this is completely 
bizarre behavior, but it seems to be what is happening in our new climate world. Well, even the lakes are getting warmer, and we have new science out on that. I'm looking for an interview with an assistant professor at the University of Toronto who just published on, uh, quote, widespread loss of lake ice around the northern hemisphere in a warming world, end quote, and that will affect snow downwind from those lakes. But I wonder what else? I mean, ecological systems, species loss, invasive species. We have some science about the loss of sea ice and what it does, but I wonder about the loss of lake ice. Yes, you know, a lot of northern lakes, the ice is not forming. It's forming later. It's not forming as thickly. It's melting earlier. It's having a huge disruption of all of those freshwater ecosystems. These effects are most significant, of course, in northern lakes because remember that temperature change from climate change is you know, much, much faster in the polar regions. As you go closer to the pole, you get much more rapid changes in temperature. If the temperature you know, at the equator, the temperature is rising enough, but it's mostly the humidity that's rising because the higher temperatures there lead to more evaporation, more humidity. And of course, that when you combine the humidity and the temperature reach that, you know, the horrendous 35 degrees Celsius wet bulb temperature, then those areas can become kind of uninhabitable. I mean, this is a huge question that I'm always asked, you know, where are we going to head next with the jet streams? So I did a number of videos on the idea that the center of cold is shifting in the Arctic. So as we move to a blue ocean event, so the, the standard state with ice in the Arctic Ocean, ice on Greenland, you know, if you take the centroid of that cold, if you like, the weighted center of all that coldness, it's not right at the North Pole. It would be if Greenland wasn't up there, but it's shifted a bit towards Greenland, offset from the North Pole in the normal state. But now, you know, when we go to a no sea ice, you know, which would happen first in September, maybe, you know, 20, maybe in the next four or five years, it's still looking, or even three years, uh, 2022 perhaps, who knows exactly, but it's going to happen. The trends are saying it's going to happen. Then the center of cold will shift. The extreme is if there's no sea ice year round, then the center of cold will be the center of Greenland, which is at 83 degrees north latitude. So that would represent a shift of the center of action of jet streams of almost 17 degrees. So the jet stream would shift down towards Greenland, which would make North America probably the coldest spot, the coldest holdout left on the planet. And we're seeing some of that. So I'm wondering if some of this is coming into play already. And then, of course, you have to consider that the air movement like when the Arctic Ocean's covered in ice, it acts as a continental climate in a way. So cold air over Siberia will come directly across the ice, and the ice acts as like a land surface. I mean, there's no water, there's no significant open water to affect the air movement. But when the Arctic is completely open and there's no sea ice, apart from the rapid warming and the loss of, because of latent heat effects causing huge warming, that energy isn't changing phase anymore from ice to liquid, it's just heating the liquid, then that will completely modify these patterns. So, so the, the patterns that we see will be completely rewritten on the planet for, the, for that period of time. And of course, that has huge implications, not just in the Northern Hemisphere, but in the Southern Hemisphere as well. Radio Ecoshock. This is Radio Ecoshock. My guest is Paul Beckwith, climate scientist from Ottawa, Canada. We're talking through the latest shocking science news about rapid climate change. If you want to follow up on any story, you can get the links to everything we talk about in my show blog at ecoshock.org. There's new science out, and I'm going to take a couple of minutes just to read from this press release because it's pretty shocking. It says, melting ice sheets may cause climate chaos, according to new modeling, and current international climate policies do not take into full account the effects on the global climate. I have an interview request into the lead author in New Zealand, and I want to take this time just to read from this press release from McGill University in Canada, because this is going to impact a lot of listeners. Warming in eastern Canada and cooling in northwestern Europe. The ice sheet simulation suggests the fastest increase in the rise of sea levels is likely to occur between 2065 and 2075. Now, a lot of you are going to be alive then. 
Melting ice sheets will affect water temperatures and circulation patterns in the world's oceans, which will in turn affect air temperatures in a complex ice-ocean atmosphere feedback loop. And uh, they say water levels will not simply rise like in a bathtub. Some areas in the world, such as island nations in the Pacific, would experience a large rise in sea level, while close to the ice sheets, the sea level would actually fall. However, they continue, the effects of ice sheet melt are far more widespread than simply leading to changes in sea levels. As warmer melt enters the oceans, for example, in the North Atlantic Ocean, major ocean currents, such as the Gulf Stream, will be significantly weakened. This will lead to warmer temperatures in the high Arctic, eastern Canada, and Central America, and cooler temperatures over northwestern Europe on the other side of the Atlantic. So they're talking, you know, 50 years or so from now, there could be a real speed up an increase in the rise of sea levels and big changes to the weather in large parts of North America and Europe. So your comments, Paul? Yes, we we must have one of these Vulcan mind melds going on, Alex, because that paper, I skimmed through that paper uh, just in, you know, it just came out and uh, it's also going to be, you know, uh, dissected in in, um, a video. But Yes, near the ice sheets, the sea level will actually drop because the ice sheets have enormous gravitational attraction of waters. You know, Greenland actually pulls the oceans closer towards it because of all that massive ice on Greenland. So as the ice sheets rapidly melt and uh, lose mass, you know, over 250 gigatons, a billion tons per year, each, you know, Antarctica, Greenland then there's less water pulled towards them. So the sea level can actually locally decrease in those regions. And this is also a, was a big puzzle. And there's also the phenomena of isostatic rebound, where when the ice leaves the land surface, that immense weight, three kilometers of ice would push the land down a kilometer in the steady state. So when that ice melts back, the land will rise up. So it's rapidly rising up in large parts of the, the northern regions just from this effect, too. So you have all of these other effects going on, and I'm sure they're accounting for them in this ice melt paper that you, you've just been quoting. You know, also, there was a recent paper, um, you know, on the Thwaites Glacier in West Antarctica, and a huge hole was found inside the glacier. And this hole was etched out by warm, salty ocean water. The glacier sitting on bedrock well below sea level, And this cavern or huge cavity in the glacier, it was actually measured to be four kilometers long by 10 kilometers wide by by about 1,000 feet or 300 meters high. And the water, the ice that melted in that was about 14 gigatons of ice. And that's just one feature in one glacier, you know, and they happened to be looking in that region and and spotted it with, with their ice penetrating radar and also their satellite radar is measuring the distance from the satellite to the surface of the ice so they could see changes. So at the surface of the ice, it decreased in height. So the ice is melting, you know, decreasing in height, but it's mostly melting from below in Antarctica. Yeah, that story, for some reason, is one of those that just freaked me out because uh, I just covered with Eric Reno two weeks ago the story that Antarctica is losing six times more ice mass annually now than 40 years ago. Now, that's as shocking as it gets. But then to feel that the ice is disappearing deep underneath that hole of Antarctica, you know, we can look down from space and we see this big white blob and it's always used to be represented in climate models as a slab. But now we know that a lot of Antarctica is actually deep underwater, perhaps pushed there by the weight of the ice. And the warmer oceans are just Soaking up under there, we don't know how many caverns like that there are, how many tunnels where the warm water is just undercutting the glaciers. We could see some big changes in Antarctica that uh, may surprise us. Yes, you know, also East Antarctica, the same sort of thing. We thought it was a very quite stable because most of it is of that ice is grounded on uh, bedrock that is above sea level, whereas West Antarctica has vast regions that are of ice that are grounded. At well below sea level, we're talking about over a mile below sea level, like 7,000 feet in some regions where the ice is sitting on the bottom, 7,000 feet below existing sea level. So, of course, as the ice melts from the bottom, the surface will drop 
and the ice will eventually start floating. And then, you know, of course, the tides have a huge influence in bringing the water in and taking the water out on a daily cycle, washing the warm, salty water in, and then the meltwater will be cold, fresher water, and that will be washed out. And uh, it repeats the process. So as long as these nonlinear, highly nonlinear processes happen, um, then the rate of ice loss, mass loss from Greenland and Antarctica seems to be doubling about every seven years or so. So if you take, and this has happened for at least the last three doubling periods, 20 years or so, and if you continue that doubling period, we're talking about huge sea level rises. You know, I've done a couple of videos. I said, can the sea level rise seven meters by 2070? And uh, that's actually, you know, if you just do back of the end of old calculations of the doubling period, then we get enormous sea level rises. Nothing like what is the IPCC and other people are talking. But, you know, as long as we get surprises in how fast the ice is melting that keep up the nonlinear doubling period, which is exponential decline, then that's what the basic back of the envelope calculations give you, which is would be horrendous for society, of course, you know, coastal cities. I mean, look at the effect of society when, when a couple of buildings come down. Now consider all the buildings in major cities along the coastlines having to be abandoned. I mean, the economic implications are, are staggering. Yes, indeed. And here's another example of that exponential rise. It's a paper that came out January 21st. The title is Greenland Ice Melting Four Times Faster Than in 2003, Study Finds. And it says southwest part of the island could be a major contributor to sea level rise. Lead author Michael Bevis from Ohio State University says, quote, In the case of Greenland, global warming has brought summertime temperatures in a significant portion of Greenland close to the melting point, and the North Atlantic Oscillation has provided that extra push that caused large areas of ice to melt. So there's another case, you know, faster four times than 2003. That's just recent history. Yeah, yeah. Well, this is exactly, it fits right on what I'm talking about with the seven-year doubling period. So, you know, if you have a melt rate in 2003 of X, and it's 2X seven years later, and seven years after that, it, it's 2 times 2X, which is 4X, which is 4. So that fits with that seven-year doubling period. And also the problem is is that we're in the meltwater from these uh, glaciers is high concentrations of methane they're finding. There's organic material underneath the ice on the surface layers of, above the bedrock and stuff, organic uh, matter, and that's decomposing with the warm, salty water coming in, and then that's producing methane because it's anoxic. There's little oxygen down there, and that methane gets dissolved in the water column, which is in, in, the, in, the, in the runoff that comes out you know, the water leaving the bottom of the glacier is high in this, uh, saturated in methane as well. So this is another uh, big factor. Also, those lakes that you're talking about in the northern regions that are not freezing so long, they're thawing earlier, and uh, they're also, a lot of these are producing huge amounts of methane. And there's new lakes appearing because of the areas of unfrozen ground, the talix and the permafrost as it thaws out. If there was a lot of water content in it, then it will collapse. And you'll, you'll get a crater, if you like, and a lake appearing there. And then those lakes are producing huge amounts of methane. So, uh, you know, not <laughs> not, uh, not a very um, good situation, to say the least. Well, I said at the start, you know, this is the end of the Age of Ice, and we go from Greenland to the Himalayas. I, I know you know a lot about this. I just want to read briefly from a new report called the Hindu Kush Himalaya Assessment. It's an open access book online. I'll put a link to it in my show blog at ecoshock.org. But what they say in summary is that the scientists found that if nations drastically cut greenhouse gas emissions and keep global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius, 2.7 degrees Fahrenheit, the Hindu Kush Himalaya range will lose one third of its ice by 2100. Well, we can kiss that goodbye because as we're going to talk about a little later, there are predictions already that will hit 1.5 degrees in the 2020s. But then they say a temperature rise of 2 degrees C would lead to 50% of the ice being lost, and a global temperature increase of 4 to 5 degrees would melt two-thirds of the region's glaciers. They've already lost 15% of its ice since the 1970s. This is just a disaster for India, for Pakistan, for China, for Tibet. All of these places are getting huge amounts of water and hydroelectricity, crop irrigation, from that ice in the Himalayas, 
and it's going, going, and will be gone, I think. Yeah, it's crazy. Like, So there's less snow you know, in these high-altitude regions, and the snow up in these mountain regions is like a battery, if you like. It's like a storage. I mean, that when it starts to melt in the spring, it releases water, which feeds all these rivers. So the problem is, is with climate change, there's less snow falling in these regions, so the storage is much slower. The melting in the spring is much, much faster. So instead of getting a a steady stream of water in the spring, you get this massive uh, deluge of water, you know, over a period of a few weeks, causing huge flooding damages along these rivers. And then these rivers dry up and there's very little water source in the summers. And and this affects, uh, you know, so there's drought and no water supply. And this affects, you know, 1.9 billion people, I believe the paper said. Well, here's one, Paul, as we just cover these melting ice regions that maybe you've heard about, maybe you haven't. I I was shocked to learn about it just last night. And it's about extreme temperature. Uh, This was posted February 5th, 2019, that the southernmost parts of Chile and Argentina hit 90 degrees Fahrenheit. And this is just crazy stuff. They had to close schools and government buildings because they're not designed to cope with temperatures, anything like that. There's a local beach, and I put that in quotes, which is generally the cold front facing Antarctica. It's populated by penguins, if anything. And suddenly there are stunned humans down there. It's pretty cold to go in, but it's just that hot, and they haven't seen it. And another person comments uh, to that post. They say, I've been to Argentina and the Chilean Patagonia, 38 degrees C at the southern icefield glaciers like Perita Morena, Viedama. Uppsala and Gray is incredibly scary. The South Icefield Glaciers is the third largest reservoir of ice on the planet after Antarctica and Greenland. I didn't know that, and now it's in danger. Yes, Australia is getting nailed. We've all heard of that, right? The temperature is up to 50 degrees, and uh, also this has actually come to South America, as, as you say. When those type of temperatures hit people, like in Australia, you know, they're they're used to hot temperatures, but not that hot and not for such a long period of time. So they have uh, air conditioning, but they had lots of brownouts and uh, power failures because the demand on the power grid for the air conditioning has just been too severe. But in places in South America, where countries aren't as wealthy and also they, they're, this is completely new to them, these type of temperatures... So they don't have air conditioning. They can't, you know, they can't get out of the heat. You know, these heat waves are killer, sort of like the silent killer, if you like. You know, the key thing is that the temperature is not dropping at night, right? It's not. It stays very, very warm at night. It doesn't allow the human body to recover from all the stresses of the heat during the day. And then it's a cumulative thing. And, you know, very young people, very old people are much more susceptible. They're nowhere near as physically resilient to withstand these sort of processes. So... Yes, most of the physical changes to the ice, of course, are in the northern hemisphere that we talk about, the greatly warming Arctic, but we're seeing significant changes to the sea ice that forms off Antarctica. It used to grow about 1.5% per decade, and we've had record lows recently, and there's also clear indications that the ocean currents around Antarctica have been changing. And uh, Hansen, in a few papers, has talked about the warm, salty, deep water that can penetrate further under the ice in Antarctica, you know, to greatly increase the melt and that sort of thing. So because the Arctic is much darker than it used to be, it's absorbing more energy, so it's warmer. We've got this Arctic temperature amplification. So because the temperature gradient is lower between the equator and the Arctic, the Arctic's warming by itself directly as a darker place, then more of that heat from the equator is going to the southern hemisphere. And this is what's happening in South America. This is what's happening in Australia. There's more heat being carried into the southern hemisphere. The southern hemisphere is not a bug-out haven for people who want to avoid the worst of climate change. I'm sorry, it just doesn't work. You're listening to EcoShock Radio for the world. I'm Alex Smith. Get it all at our website, ecoshock.org. This is Radio EcoShock with your host, Alex Smith. 
You are tuned to Radio EcoShock. I'm Alex Smith. My guest has become the largest single climate science teacher on the Internet with over 500 videos on YouTube, and they are great videos. I watch them. Paul Beckwith joins us again from Ottawa, Canada. Well, New Zealand has just been hacked with hot weather. It's been way too hot for people in the capital of Wellington, and few people have air conditioners there. And the seas around New Zealand, the Tasman Sea, has been way, way too hot. And I would like to add that the island of Tasmania is under a heat wave. And, and under under wildfire. Wildfires, yeah, so, yes. Yeah, yeah. They, there's a new phenomenon down there. It's it's so hot and dry, there's huge evaporation. Of course, the vegetation is very stressed. And then we're getting these thunderstorms now where it's so hot and dry on the ground that the water, the rainfall evaporates before it hits the ground. So you still get all the lightning. So it's dry lightning. So all of these lightning strikes are occurring on the very dry forest, causing these massive wildfires. Like it's not wet surface, right? <laughs> lightning can always hit a wet surface and not cause the fires. But this dry lightning phenomena is, is, is there in Tasmania now. That's a big deal. And they had world-class, world-protected forests that hadn't burned for thousands of years, that burned a couple of years ago. Uh, so they're feeling the the terror of the wildfires that we feel here in British Columbia and people in California and all across Western North America. And I want to get over, too, to something that we've, we have just touched on, and that is the ocean warming. And uh, I was looking at new science, but this was actually back in 2016, so I guess I won't call it new science, but it says... Industrial era global ocean heat uptake doubles in recent decades. Peter Gleckler was the lead author of that. But here's what interests me. It says, our model-based analysis suggests that nearly half of industrial era increases in global heating of the oceans have occurred in recent decades. So it's just the last few decades are really smacking into the oceans. Is that your perception as well? You know, if you look at any metric on climate change, really, you know, it's, it's the last few decades. Um, human emissions in the last few decades have equaled what we'd put in the atmosphere in the previous hundred years sort of thing, right? So we're on the tips of these exponential curves going up. And, that, you know, that's true whether, you know, look at emissions or ocean heat or even the uh, temperature rise, which is covered quite a bit in, in James Hansen's uh, February 4th paper, Global Temperature in 2018 and Beyond. He talks about some things like that. Well, talk to us about that paper. I'm really interested. Yes, all the details I'll put in a separate video. But basically, from 1970 to 2018, we've had a rise of 0.17 degrees Celsius per decade. And, of course, we had these uh, super El Ninos in, in 2015 and 2016, and also in, in 1998, you know, which caused spikes. Of course, he talks about the, the last four years, including 2018, being the warmest. 2016 was the warmest. Now, he shows images of maps of where the warming is occurring, how it's distributed. And 2016, the warmest year, was a degree Celsius warmer than the 1951 to 1980 mean. Now, they use that mean when they did the map because they had lots of data then. But then if you compare it to the 1880 to 1920 mean or average, you need to add 0.27 degrees. Now, if you compare the 1880 to 1800 time frame, you need to add about another 0.1 degree, and from 1800 back to 1750, another 0.1 degree at least, and even from 1880 to 1920, the temperature rose about 0.1. So you have to add 0.2 or 0.3 degrees. So if you add that to 2016, relative to 1750, we were at between 1.47 and 1.57 degrees Celsius rise in temperature. Of course, this is significant because Paris is all about 1.5 aspiration, right? So, so um, Hansen also talks about how quickly the land temperatures are rising relative to the ocean temperatures. So, you know, I've already said the global average temperature has risen since 1970, 0.17 degrees Celsius per year. 
Now, if you separate that into land and ocean, the ocean's risen surface has risen about 0.1 degree Celsius per year, and the, and the land temperatures has risen at almost three times the rate. We all live on the land, at least at the moment. So unless you're in a nuclear submarine for a few years, um, closest you are to living on the, in the ocean, it would be a small island in the middle, middle of the ocean somewhere. But anyway, the... the um, you know, these numbers are actually broken down in great detail in this paper. What I really also like about the paper is the chance of an El Nino appearing is about, it was mentioned as being 70%, you know, back in December. You know, maybe it's about 65% chance of happening this year, but it probably wouldn't be as strong as the previous El Nino. Also, there's uh, some really interesting data on solar irradiance and sunspots. And, you know, yes, we are going into a solar minimum, right? In the next two years, we might reach the minimum of sunspots. But the variation of solar intensity is only 0.10%. So it's a very, very small fraction. It does have an impact. One of the things that contributed to the strong El Nino in 2015 and 2016 is we were near the peak of the solar cycle, right? So that would have added that small percentage increase. It would have contributed to that strong El Nino, but the effect is completely overwhelmed, really, by greenhouse gases. So all of these things are in this recent paper. Yeah, I'll put a link up to that. And, and NASA also put out a press release saying that the five hottest years in the record are the last five years. And uh, I'll put that up in my blog. Yes, yes. That's the Goddard Institute of uh, Space Studies, which is NASA talking about this data, which is in, in the Hansen paper. And Gavin Schmidt is also on the uh, on that paper, the, the Hansen paper. He does the reports for GIS, Goddard Institute of Space Studies. Then we have the Met Office in Britain saying that the world is heading for its warmest decade. That's their prediction. Well, that isn't too hard a prediction to make considering what we've been talking about. But it does say that in the next five years, there's also a chance we will see a year in which the average global temperature rise could be greater than 1.5 degrees C. Not 1.5 in a single year, but greater than that 1.5 above pre-industrial that we talked about. So they're saying that before 2025, let's say, there's a good chance that at least one year will already be above what Paris Climate Agreement set out as their hoped-for target. The aspirational 1.5, yes. I wonder if they mentioned in that article that, yeah, we, we actually already crossed 1.5. and The year 2016 was 1.47 to 1.57 above the 1750 pre-industrial temperature because of the strong uh, El Nino. So what the Met Office is saying is that, uh, you know, this will happen in a non-El Nino year. It won't get that additional bump from heat being released from the oceans, which happens in El Ninos. And, of course, the same story was covered by Britain's Daily Mail newspaper, and I had the honor of going back and reading the comments down below the article, and I got things like this, all rubbish. Multiple volcanoes are going off all over the world as we speak, that's more greenhouse than we can create in a lifetime. It's all lies, folks, says one commenter. And the next one says, just out of interest, where are the grants coming from that makes scientists so wealthy that they're happy to lie about their findings, end quote? But, you know, maybe those are real posts from very poorly informed people, or maybe they're just Russian bots out there trying to stir us up and keep the fossil fuels coming from Russia to Europe. Who knows? Yeah. Yeah, I know. That's the problem, you know, with this information. And uh, we talked at the beginning of our interview about this cold spot over North America. And the best illustration of this is, is figure four of the Hansen paper, which you'll post a link to. It breaks it down by season, the temperatures. It gives a map of the world and it shows the regions that are colder and warmer than normal relative to the 1950 to 51 to 1980 average. And the September, October, November map, there's a blue area, a cold area covering North America. Every other part of the planet is red and brown, you know, much warmer than normal. And, you know, that pattern has obviously continued December, January, February of 2019 as well. Check out the Radio EcoShock website. We're at ecoshock.org. 
This is Radio EcoShock. Paul Beckwith, Canadian climate scientist, is my guest. You've been talking about something that really interests me, which is kind of negative feedbacks. I mean, we have in the natural world a lot of different cycles going on with the oceans, in the atmosphere, and even including our position in space, as we learned from a guest a couple of weeks ago on Radio EcoShock, the tilt towards the sun matters. Uh, You brought up sunspots. But I think the key thing is that those negative feedbacks or negative cycles may have held us back and made it seem cooler than we actually are. But that means we're in for a shock when they go back the other way and they start pushing even hotter. So your comments on that, Paul? Yeah, um, there is, of course, short-term fluctuation, but it's really the, the trends that are key. I really want to bring people back to a paper in 2017. And it's, it's, anybody can access it. It's open source. It's Creative Commons. It's by a whole bunch of authors. It's called Young People's Burden, Requirement of Negative CO2 Emissions. You know, Hansen's the lead author. It talks about why we absolutely have to remove CO2 from the atmosphere. That's the idea of negative CO2 emissions. But in, in the uh, paper, it talks about the changes from the the different forcings of the gases. So if you average the forcing, how much energy is there, power is there, watts per square meter at the surface of the Earth on average from all of the different gases that we put in the atmosphere? CO2, of course, is the big one. It's 2.1 watts per square meter. I'm talking about figure four in this paper. Methane is 0.8. CFC 0.4, nitrous oxide 0.2, ozone 0.2. So so you add those up and you get 3.7 watts per square meter. Uh, Per square meter, that's an average forcing on the surface of the Earth from the additional burden of greenhouse gases since 1750 that we've put in. And the aerosols are minus 1.2, and that's a 3.7 minus 1.2 is that 2.5 number right, which is like 2.5 watts per square meter. It's like one of those little Christmas light bulbs, you know, on every square meter of the earth. That's the the forcing that's causing all of our problems. But the aerosol is a big component. So the aerosols, you know, as we phase out coal and things like that, you know, this global dimming effect will decrease and decrease. So the warming will accelerate. So this is why, you know, I'm saying that we absolutely have to look at solar radiation management techniques to compensate for this. Uh, You know, it's all pretty clear what we need to do, and I'm really hoping that the push by progressives in the U.S. for this, the the New Green Deal, uh, groups like Extinction Resistance and Solar Sunrise, you know, these different groups, more and more cities are calling climate emergencies. I think Vancouver was one of the ones recently. You know, what does this mean when when a city calls a climate emergency? It means that they have to greatly increase the rate at which their their climate action to reduce emissions is, is for the most part, that's what they're looking at. But the New Green Deal is all about completely, you know, on a World War II scale effort, completely retooling the U.S. to renewables by the year 2030, which is only in 12 years, which is that time frame you know, we've got 12 years left to do stuff, which, you know, would be a whole new show to talk about whether that's valid or not. 12 years, I mean, how, where does that number come from, 12 years, right? Well, you know, 10 years ago, people said we only had 10 years. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, yeah, that's a pretty amorphous figure. But I, I know that the climate mobilization launched a city-by-city strategy after Donald Trump got elected because they figured, well, it's just not going to happen in Washington. Maybe with the Democrats, there's new hope. But we have seen declarations, as you said, from Vancouver, Canada, Hayward, California, and in the United Kingdom, Cornwall and Lambeth. And then just out on the news that Halifax has also declared Halifax, Canada, a climate emergency. But I have to say, they're not always the greatest declarations. Vancouver said they wanted to be fossil free by 2050. Well, <laughs> As you've just said, if it isn't by 2030, it's not really going to help us much. The ice we just talked about will be all over and uh, there will be global ruin, I would say. You raised another topic that I've been working hard on, which is the aerosols, basically the smog or the pollution, the global dimming, call it what you want. I did interview Yang Yang Shu a couple of weeks ago who found that over China, even though they're cutting back on their emissions, 
with some success, they will still get more smog there because of regional conditions that develop due to climate change. So climate change is actually going to make the smog a little more easy to form and a little more available. And there's a new paper out just published February 4th, 2019, called Enhanced Land-Sea Warming Contrast Elevates Aerosol Pollution in a Warmer World. And so they're saying that uh, they have confidence that a warmer world will be associated with more aerosol pollution. So in a way, we're going to be cutting back and trying to clean up because people need to, to breathe. People are dying of pollution. But even as we do it, the climate itself is going to make the pollution that's left sort of more available and, and more there. And, and we thought it was going to get rained out. And I asked Yang Yang Shu about that. And he said, well, you get extreme precipitation events. Yes, they do clear out the air. But then you have following dry periods that are longer. And during that time, the smog forms. So they don't think, uh, neither one of these papers thinks that uh, the increased rainfall is going to help us really clean the air enough. Where the rain is falling is is obviously uh, changing. So we're getting, as you say, torrential rainfalls. And, you know, that will completely clear out the aerosols in a particular region. But a light rain would clear out the aerosols, <laughs> right? So all that extra rain in the same area is not getting extra aerosols. They've already been rained out in the first part of the rainfall, whereas, you know, areas that are under drought and, uh, you know, where, where there's lots of loss of moisture of water from the soils and from the vegetation and stuff, then, of course, those regions will be dustier. And then it depends on the wind uh, patterns as well as to how much of those, uh, you know, aerosols are lofted up, particles are lofted up and become aerosols from, from the ground, for example. Well, my sense, Paul, looking at all this, is that a combination of climate pressure, some small, some large, could push us up a step in heating. And in fact, we've just had the hottest five years ever. You spent a few years investigating abrupt climate change, and scientific studies have shown that that has happened in the past. Do you think it's happening now? Are we just on a new step on the on-ramp? Yes, I would always call it abrupt climate change. And, you know, lately, you know, sometimes I say rapid climate change or very rapid climate change. But, you know, abrupt is sort of a, a term that's a bit loosely defined because you have to find, you know, abrupt with respect to what time scale. Definitely people think in a linear fashion. Right. They think, OK, temperature rise. I mean, I actually talked. I said that on average, we're getting 0.17 degrees Celsius increase per decade since 1970. Now, if you look at just the last few years, right, it's much, much more than 0.17. Like the last decade, you know, has not been 0.17. The last decade has been much, much higher than that temperature rise. So it's always a, a moving target when you have nonlinear change. This is why all these papers and all this science work on climate change uh, has to say this is much faster than expected because a lot of the models and stuff, they kind of work on this premise that things are going to change in a, in a sort of li linear fashion. And that's clearly not how the real world works. So we really have to get a handle on that. And when we do get a handle on it, we recognize, hey, we're in a climate change emergency. You know, we're going through abrupt change, and this is why you can't think when something happens one year, you can't expect that the same thing will happen the next year. For example, you know, a local example for me is I had friends that were, live on the Ottawa River that were flooded out during the record rainfall a couple of years ago, and they were all paranoid. They were all scared stiff that the following year would flood them out again, and, and the following year was a, was a bust as far as rainfall was concerned. The Mississippi River will go from record flooding one year to record low levels the next year, you know, interrupting shipping abilities, barge traffic, to record flooding even the third year, even worse than the first year. And this is this climate whiplashing, weather whiplashing or wilding, right? It's, it's from boom to bust cycles. Uh, it's huge variability. The variability of our climate and weather systems has shot off the charts. You've suggested, Paul, and you've been saying this for years, that we should spray some aerosols over the Arctic and try and save what's left of the Arctic sea ice because it has such a huge effect on the climate of the rest of the world. I'm trying to picture that. For one thing, you know, it makes me very nervous as an environmentalist uh, while we're trying to clean up the smog in one part of the world. We're going to add what is essentially pollution in another part of the world. 
Do you think that will just slow down the loss of sea ice? Could we actually try and cool the whole planet? Is there any chance of going backwards towards the climate that humans evolved in? What are your thoughts? It's vital that we slash fossil fuel emissions, right? It's vital, but that's only one part of it. It's also vital that we pull CO2 out of the atmosphere so that it, as well as slashing, you know, what we put in the atmosphere, we deploy methods, whether it's using biomimic. I think the oceans are the key, we, but we reduce CO2 levels. I mean, a healthy climate is, is CO2 levels that were about the 300 level, right? Uh, there's a group 350 now that says 350. We have to got to get back down to there. Healthy Climate Alliance is saying 300 you know, is this possible? I mean, if you don't have a goal, then uh, it's certainly not possible. You know, you have to set a goal first and try to get there. But, you know, this stuff's all too slow. We lose Arctic sea ice in a few years. Greenland's exposed and vulnerable. You know, rates are going to skyrocket there. You know, we lose the air conditioning of the Arctic. Temperatures there skyrocket. Our jet streams are completely refigured. So, you know, if there's any possible way to cool the Arctic, then then yes. And we know when a vo- large volcano goes off and puts sulfur dioxide up in the atmosphere, it cools the planet. It can be half a degree or a degree for three years, right? And we know it's the sulfur dioxide in the uh, volcanic, that the element, the, the molecule that comes out, which does the cooling. So if we do an artificial, uh, you know, we put that stuff up artificially, In the upper atmosphere, we can cool the planet. We know the physics works on that. Now, the thing is, is that this is an emergency type situation, right, where, you know, we're losing our food supply or something on the planet. The climate takes out multiple sources of food on the planet. People are starving to death. It's an emergency. People are dying in droves. You know, we could deploy this and cool the planet, right? Now, the thing is, is, you know, do we leave it that late? Like, it's much better than, there's things that are much better than sulfur, like iron salt aerosol is a very interesting technology. There's a 54-page paper that came out a couple of years ago, and I'm still reading it, trying to understand it. It's not, it's, not, it's not easy reading, but the idea is that during previous glaciations, there'd be drying of deserts, and then particles would come up, and they would add iron to the oceans, which would stimulate phytoplankton blooms, which would draw vast amounts of CO2 out of the atmosphere. So the idea of these iron salt aerosols are to create aerosols with iron content that can increase the amount of iron going into the ocean on a widespread basis. And we're talking about micro levels, not putting huge amounts in, that will stimulate phytoplankton and draw out carbon from the atmosphere. These also are aerosols, so they provide the aerosol cooling over the oceans, right, to cool the oceans. So these things can be... It's like both techniques. It's like carbon dioxide removal, and it's like solar radiation management. It's all with one technology. And the concentrations are so small, you know, it's not quite as innocuous as marine cloud brightening, which is just pumping seawater through nozzles and then the salt particles from the seawater that go into the air. If they're the certain size, they create very small water vapor condenses, creating very, very small droplets, which then have a lot of reflective capability to brighten the clouds, the marine clouds, to reflect solar energy, right, to reduce the uh, warming. So this is a technique that Stephen Salter has been working on for years. There are some technologies like this that are becoming very promising. There's a company called Blue Planet that is looking at removing CO2 from the air with direct air capture and making concrete out of it, basically, using it to make the limestone and and then eventually using it to make the actual aggregate that goes into concrete. And we know how big this industry is on on the planet. It's it's a huge deal. So if we, you know, there's different companies, but they're getting nowhere near enough money and there's far too few companies. This is why I say we need to, I always come back to, let's get the U.S. military budget and let's put that budget towards getting us out of this towards preserving our life on this planet and the life of of creatures. Spending that money on the tooling with renewables, on ways to capture carbon, on ways to keep the ice in the Arctic. Like This is why calling it a climate emergency and getting all the countries in the world on board of this is the first step, or at least some of them to get a critical mass going, right? It would cause breaking and slowing down of abrupt climate change. 
might even save us. We do live in amazing times, Paul. I loved your list of things that we could be doing to get the carbon back down. We have super science arriving daily to explain how this planet works. And one thing that you said about the blue planet and about the oceans tweaked me to another piece of science that just came out, saying that the color of the oceans is actually going to change during this century due to climate change. And it sounds good in a way because, oh boy, the seas will be bluer. But you and I know that a blue sea means a dead sea. And really, humans should be thinking we need the dark green seas because that's where all the plankton is and that's where the life is. So if we're going to farm plankton to grab oxygen out of the air, we're going to be doing it closer to the poles because that's where life is going, is closer to the poles on both ends. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, think of the crystal clear, light blue color water that's in the Caribbean and, you know, in the, you know, see pictures of these resorts and stuff. And that, well, I mean, the water is that color. That's the natural color of the water without all the organic life in it, without the phytoplankton and zooplankton and all of the, all of the marine life in it. Because if it's in it, then it doesn't look that color, right? <laughs> So Sylvie Earle, you know, one of the oceanographers, she says, no blue, no green. You know, no, without the oceans, no blue. Um, we have no green on uh, land. We have no, no life on land either. So the oceans are 70% of the surface area of the Earth is the, the oceans, right? So when we think of ways to pull down CO2, you know, we talk about forests and we talk about things, you know, on land, right, for the most part. I mean, the oceans are... I think the oceans are going to save us in the end. I think these carbon dioxide removal techniques and solar radiation management techniques will mostly be ocean-based. And, you know, when I was a kid growing up, Jacques Cousteau was, was my hero. I wanted to be an oceanographer, but being landlocked, and I, I never pursued that passion. His son is sort of following in his path, and his, his son's kids, and they just came out with a uh, documentary recently on, on life in the ocean. It's, it's fascinating. I just saw it a few nights ago. I'll have to look for it. Of course, first I'll have to buy a TV that can show it. My old TV isn't so good with those uh, nature videos. <laughs> no, it was at a theater, which was surprising to me. <laughs> wow. Okay, so why are you making 500 videos? What, what are you up to with your YouTube presence? Well, it wasn't really planned in advance that I'd be so prolific and do this for so long, but I just um, kind of realized that there's a big gap. There's a huge chasm between science and the general public, right? And, and very little information crosses that chasm. And I saw this huge need for somebody who can understand, read and understand all of the science and put this in everyday language and communicate this science. And so as you said at the beginning, there's so much information coming out. Like the public doesn't have filters, doesn't really know, unless they look at this in detail and have the time to do that, they don't know what's important and what's not. So not only communicating the science to the general public, but actually communicating the things that are the most important. The, the things that are the most significant that will affect their lives, you know, because of the uh, changing climate. And the, the, the problem is, is that in order to do all of this, then it didn't really allow me to do the individual science myself, right? Which at a university, if you're, if you're not becoming so specialized and doing the work in one very specialized narrow area, then you're not going to be really, you know, you're, I mean, that's what not recognized by the system. So this is a, one of the whole problems, the siloing of science and the way the whole scientific system is set up. It's sort of this specialization has dominated things and problems like climate change have just, you know, gotten way out of hand, not been uh, dealt with and the risks haven't been communicated to people. You know, I saw this as an important role to uh, take up. So, so that's sort of what, what I've done. Well, you get the picture, people. Paul is the best access point for a kind of planet-wide climate teaching on YouTube, and you can find him at paulbeckwith.net or follow his Facebook feed, which is really lively, at paul.beckwith.9. And I will put links to everything we've been talking about here in my own show blog at ecoshock.org, but I really encourage you to go to paulbeckwith.net, and to support Paul if you can, because 
he's really one of the few doorways from science to the public, and he keeps on top of it as it breaks. He brings out a video to explain what James Hansen is saying, to say what all these scientists are saying in plain English that we can all follow. So I sure appreciate you joining us here again this week on Radio EcoShock. Thank you, Paul. Well, thank you, Alex. It's been a pleasure. I'm Alex Smith reporting. 